Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth and final day of World Women Congress 2021. My name is Alexandra Huidu, and I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce to you today one of our uh, best researchers in Lumen Research and um, uh, Humanistic Sciences, one of our dear friends and one of our dear colleagues, uh, PhD Anna Frunze, who is going to um, hold this masterclass that we have in store for you today. And um, I can't wait for the masterclass to begin because the title is, um, is most exquisite, Ethical Violations That Occurred in the Harrietta Lacks and Typhoid Mary Kay Studies, Key Similarities or Differences from a Public Health Ethics Perspective. But before moving on to the masterclass, let me tell you a few things about who Anna Frunze is. She has attained the title of Doctor of Philosophy from Alexandru Ioan Cusa University from Yash, Romania in 2014, with a thesis towards a new ethical expertise deconstructing ethical values. She is a scientific researcher within the Lumen Social and Humanistic uh, Research Center from Yash, Romania. Her main areas of interest are applied ethics, applied philosophy, social work, supervision of social services, ethics of scientific research, bioethics, and ethical expertise. As a fellowship researcher in an advanced program in research ethics conducted by the Union Graduate College Center for Bioethics and Clinical Readership from New York, in partnership with the Department of Medical and Ethical History of Vilnius University from Lithuania, she has graduated courses in international bioethics, international research ethics, and research ethics in 2016. A significant part of her scientific research revolves around the construction of frameworks for the development of ethical expertise in the field of social services, seeking throughout a methodology based on deconstructivism originated in Derridian philosophy, the development of a new model of ethical expertise and ethical supervision. Her research undertaken so far is based in addition to reflecting on ethical expertise in the field of social work practice and the attempt to identify the constructive ethical values of social practice in the promotion of which ethical expertise through various application models is involved. In the field of research ethics, her scientific efforts have corroborated the activities carried out during the Advanced Research Ethics Program followed in 2014-2015, supported by Fogarty International Center, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, National Institute on Drug Abuse from the USA, in this program, she carried out the research project informed consent between theory and practice in northeastern region of Romania medical research field within the Lumen Research Center in Social and Humanistic Sciences. She is an associate uh, lecturer at Stefan cel Mare University from, Yash, uh, from uh, Suchava. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, let Anna uh, have her speech and then we will move to discussions. But first, Anna. What is, with, uh, what is with those cases and why did you pick them? Thank you, Alexandra, for introducing me. Thank you for your um, speech, for your um, uh, nice words. Um, actually, these cases, um, both of them, I was um, approached uh, them as a fellow within a public health ethics course. And um, I brought them into attention now because I wanted to uh, go a bit deeper in these uh, cases. And I uh, somehow um, went forward to see the new perspectives that uh, scientific literature and non-scientific literature uh, discuss about them now, because these cases are used, still used in uh, international debates, in uh, research ethics and bioethics uh, trainings and so on. So uh, I think these uh, this case studies can be uh, still useful for the practitioners in the field. And I'm going to start now. Thank you for your introduction once again. So I'm going to ask you something like this. Can you imagine a case scenario where, um, where identifiable patients to more cells were used for countless scientific experiments? without the patient informed consent. Can you imagine this nowadays? Or can you imagine in the current COVID-19 pandemic context, the forced isolation in solitude for 26 years of a human being having only a dog as a companion? And that would be just say for the best interest of the, of the others. 
Let's consider that into an ideal reality, worldwide safeguards are in the place today to prevent such ethical breaches. But in 1951, Henrietta Lacks, an Afro-American woman with cervical tumor, and her family weren't as lucky. Uh, neither the Irish immigrant Mary Mellon, a health typhoid carrier, was starting with 1907. Henrietta Lacks became an icon after her death based on her immortal cells, continuously reproduced and used since 1951 till today. Henrietta's story raises questions about ethics, race, education, access, and genetics. How? Let's see her story. Without Henrietta Lacks knowing some tissue was removed from her tumor and sent to George Gay's lab at John Hopkins Hospital to be cultured in test tubes. Gay never informed uh, Henrietta about her tumor was being used for research. Despite aggressive treatment, Henrietta died at the age of 31, leaving behind a husband and five young children. Years later, Henrietta children accidentally learned that their mother's cervical cancer cells, called HeLa cells, were being used in research. The cells and the experiments that were performed with them led to the creation of a massive uh, profit for profit industry. Yet, Henrietta family lived in poverty and never received any of the financial benefits derived from their mother's tumor cell. Um, I will uh, give some insights from the story said about um, uh, Henrietta uh, Lex, as Susan Mehan in April 2017 did. Literature, both scientific and non-scientific one, abounds in debates uh, of, this, of her case, either discussing the ethical acceptance of the clinical care and research practices, or discussing the utility of the cells from the medical practice development uh, at the global level. The Henrietta Lacks case was mm -hmm. considered a turning point in the bioethics development, in the case, uh, the case study being used in health ethics research and bioethics teaching programs, in research ethics debate, her story even was uh, the subject of a non-fiction book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, that was adapted into a movie released in 2017. The Henrietta Lacks case could be ethical questionable from the perspective of violation of any kind of autonomy of the human person and uh, the just distribution of medical care services. Uh, the absence of informed consent is a major violation of the patient right. Mm. More than that, Henrietta became automatically research subjects. She was a subject of medical investigation at person at the patient first and never consented for being involved in any research. Furthermore, she was neither informed of the possibility of research using her cell, cells in the benefit of the new knowledge and science improvement in medicine, nor she or her family um, was consented on that. Mm. Further, the informed consent can be understood as a process for enabling individuals to make voluntary decisions about participating in research with an understanding of the purpose, procedures, risks, benefits, and alternatives. The, this practice, the informed consent process actually, is constructed as willing to respect and put into practice well-established ethical principles, including respect for person autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, which in fact are the grounded principles of the bioethics as Beauchamp, Beauchamp and Childress uh, summarized them. Mr. Gay crossed over the person autonomy and the patient family will, so he made an injustice for a poor family in order to provoke the um, welfare and healthcare status of other millions of people on the planet, and you will see that even out of Terra in space. They use the human person as a mean and not as an end, but the end was not even part of the subject's family whose medical uh, and daily life welfare needs were so big. In terms of considering public health ethics as a moral foundation of the public health, in order to maximize the welfare, in this case, the question is at what price a practice is considered maximizing the welfare of the individuals. 
the welfare of a target population is allowed to be grounded on the poverty and sickness of the others. The vulnerable ones, one, uh, whose chances to a better life are lower. The inequity issue I consider to be another pragmatic issue in terms of life improvement of um, Henrietta's family, at least at the, and, uh, the usage of uh, uses of the cells equitably, not developing a medical industry based on HeLa cells whose uh, access will uh, have only the rich ones. Let's see this case, how this case can be understood from the point of view of biospecimen research acceptability, a field that goes to the interest of developing the knowledge in the field of medicine in serving a greater good for the largest public. From the public health ethics point of view, the HeLa um, case is one of the most important cases of biobanks policies construction. The use of biospecimens can be made based only on informed consent or by a decision taking by an um, institutional review board post analysis of the case, as the current uh, United States regulation in the field show. Even so, we are aware that regulations are violated and researches in this practice show that the experimental research on human subjects can rule with or without scientific models for um, obtaining permission for research use of uh, biospecimens. In 2016, according to BESCO study, the United States regulation defines a human subject, a living individual about whom an investigator obtained data through intervention or interaction with the individual or uh, obtain identifiable uh, private information. Thus, when an investigator interacts with a person to collect biospecimens specifically for research, informed consent and RB supervision are required. But when an investigator uses only biospecimens that have already been collected for another purpose, then no intervention and interaction with the person is involved. In, other, in order to protect uh, confidentiality, a strategy internationally used is the removal of the, of the direct identifiers and replace them with a code and take additional steps to ensure that researchers have no access to identifying information. In this case, the case of Henrietta Lacks, where the first letter of uh, her name were used as code for the cells, in today's practice could not be repeated uh, in terms of not being allowed to do that again. The case of Henrietta Lacks in 1951 turned from patient care to medical research involvement without consent. Besco in his study suggested that based on his analysis on, um, of the United States regulation, that if um, Henrietta Lacks were a patient in the United States today, biospecimens collected solely for her clinical care would not require her consent for future um, use in research. If we consider this case from the perspective of case benefit, uh, cost benefit analysis, we will um, be, uh, let's say, entitled to consider that benefits are greater than the costs, but the costs concern the ethical issue of neglecting a human being needs. The benefits of the HeLa cells over the years could be maybe unmeasurable in terms of the progress of medical practice and medical research, but also the evaluation, the evolution of, of uh, pharmaceutical industry. In uh, November 2020, uh, Zaria Gorvet from BBC said something like that. So far, the cells have contributed to over 70,000 studies and led to the discovery that the majority of cervical cancers are caused by HPV virus. The HeLa cells are considered the controversial cells that save, saved 10 million lives. I will bring also into the discussion the synthesis made by Romanian researchers in 2020, Nascutiu and Lupu, related to the field that were impacted by HeLa cells. As they shown within the article, what do we owe to Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks consideration on the ethics of biobanking? And I'm going to just read the fields that um, Sehela cells impacted. Cell culture practices, virology, bacteriology, vaccinology with polio vaccine, which led to polio eradication, actually, human papilloma virus vaccines, genetics, and here um, are implied the chromosome counting diseases linked to genetics, progress in genetic diseases diagnosis, amniocentesis for genetic disease testing and counseling, 
but also the pre-implantation genetic screening for intro, um, in vitro fertilization. Also, gene mapping was, uh, was initiated. The drug development, like new drugs for uh, Parkinson's disease, AIDS, influenza, and some cancer like cervical cancer or leukemia. A new medical techniques such as cloning and in, intro, in vitro fertilization. And uh, as I told you previously, uh, HeLa cells influenced even the space because space biology was, was started in the uh, 1960s. Studies on the effects of extreme environment perturbation and even bioweapons. What could have been done differently? if we see so far the, the case study uh, and why. The Henrietta case could be, have been more ethical acceptance, acceptable if at least the usage of the cells would have been of direct benefit for the family and it would not have become a product on, uh, on the medical market. Um, it was harm done both at psychological and emotional level in terms of family poor understanding of the, of the utility of the cells line using, and in terms of violating human rights while using the cells without prior knowledge of the patients. If we consider the, the other case, the Mary Mellon case, the so-called the typhoid Mary, we will see that um, the case has as protagonist um, an immigrant, an Irish teenage girl, Mary Mellon, who um, uh, emigrated to the United States in 1884. She has worked in a variety of domestic positions for wealthy families prior to settling into her career as a cook. Um, as a healthy carrier of Salmonella typhi, her nickname of Typhoid Mary has become synonymous with the spread of disease, as many were infected due to her denial of being ill. She was forced into quarantine two times, um, and uh, he, her quarantine uh, lasted for 26 years and ended up by dying alone. The literature brings Mary Mellon's story into the light by emphasizing the huge lack of respect for person by using her for tests, researches, studies, but never willing to go deeper uh, to the humanistic side of the, the case to go to the cause to educate her by helping her to understand how she is influencing the public health status rapidly by spreading her disease. Publications shown that uh, were uncertainties related to the treatment that Mary received from the Department of Health City of New York. The lack of uh, proper communication between health system authorities and Mary led to the unhappy life of Mary. She actually became a lab pet. More than that, she was actually never supported by the state in getting a home for herself as she was transiting cities and countries over and over again. And by doing that, Mary continued to host the bacteria, contaminating everything around her, a real threat for the surrounding environment. Maybe Mary case uh, succeeds to show how healthcare system provokes social attitudes toward disease carriers, attitudes that also come together with prejudice. This case highlighted the problematic nature of the subject with the need um, for an enhanced medical and legal social treatment model aimed at improving the status of disease carriers and limiting their impact on society. And you will find this in the literature, in the scientific literature, um, even um, uh, from Aronson, The Civil Rights of Mary Mellon, um, of an article written in 1995. You will find also um, uh, lines such as, was Mary Mellon a symbol of the threat to individual liberty or a necessary sacrifice to public health? What you will not find uh, in the literature will be an answer because it's very hard to give an answer because it raises ethical dilemmas and no, um, no straight answer can be um, considered as a final one. I consider also it is a matter of uh, social responsibility here, actually a co-responsibility in fact, um, and individual autonomy also. First, Mary Mellon should have been educated, as I previously said, in order to better understand her situation and the risks she poses at um, all the person she was cooking for. 
In this particular perspective, the American state should um, be the one who could at least provide her a shelter. And um, by doing that, she could be just say traceable and stop uh, spreading the disease. Um, this um, kind of measure could be questionable too in terms of respecting her civil rights. But I think this could, um, could have been a start in dealing with the situation. Um, the authorities approach, I, I consider to be part appropriate, part inappropriate, and uh, let me say why inappropriate. They violated her autonomy by imprisoning her and put her repeatedly in quarantine, but also it was appropriate in terms of isolating the further infections. And here comes another issue, the sacrifice of the individual for the public good. Where is the limit? Mary Mellon reactions and the lack of her lack of, uh, of responsibility um, is questionable too because um, the night the New York City Health Department took Mellon into custody in uh, 1907 and placed her into forced confinement inside a bungalow of 16 Acro North from um, North Brother Island, and she said then. I never had typhoid in my life and have also always been healthy. Why should I be banished like a leper and compelled to live in a solitary confinement with only a dog as a companion? On the one hand, she acts as an autonomous individual, but her autonomous acts and the manifest of her liberties actually violates the welfare of the public. And um, we go back and see that in 19. Uh, uh, 15, an outbreak of typhoid fever at Manhattan Sloan Maternity Hospital struck 25 workers and killed two. This um, accident is, of course, associated to typhoid memory. After this, um, this situation, she is um, again captured and uh, she is confined to North Brother Island, this time for 23 years. What could be the cost benefits um, perspective of this case? The typhoid memory isolation could be acceptable if we consider the public uh, greater good instead of the individual welfare. Um, the public good analyzed in terms of population safe from potential infection, medical science improvement and further treatments developed based on the medical discovery on the typhoid could be considered a bigger benefit than the cost if an individual life is less valuable than another. Uh, what uh, could we have done differently? Um, well, this is something weird because so far I couldn't get to something pragmatic, but I think that principles of respect for personal autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice could have been just applied in her, in her case and um, the approach of her case leads to public opinion to manifest prejudice instead of social justice, solidarity, or equal valuation, or respect for human dignity. A resistance for the human rights violation must be constructed at a society level for humans to support each other. And why am I saying that? Because even, um, even she, she was identified as a typhoid carrier, she spent alone for 23 uh, years in a um, prison. And um, after that, hundreds, if not thousands of asymptomatic carriers who has um, been led, who has been identified, walked uh, the sidewalks of New York freely, uh, was actually let be free. And that uh, injustice was too obvious. And I will end this session by uh, introducing you the key similarities or uh, differences from a public health perspective ethics. And I'm going to, to, to bring you into your attention the, the common things that these cases um, have. Both influenced the public opinion on the um, medical care and medical research credibility and trust. Each case raised powerful questions on the trust that the public may invest in the leaders of the medical world. Both cases determined the turning point um, of research ethics and public health ethics. Each of the cases raised strong ethical dilemmas of the acceptability of um, invasive medical and research practices 
for the sake of creating a greater future good for the public health benefit. Both health conditions led to self-sacrifice for the public good without their consent. Henrietta Lacks dies before her cells started to be used worldwide in the benefit of the world and less in direct benefit of her poor family, while Mary Mellon, in spite of her stubbornness of refusing self-isolation for stopping the disease spreading, actually ended in isolation and died alone after many years of solitude and social prejudice. Each case shows the inequity of the public health care system, cause um, starting uh, most probably from discrimination by race, education, access, and nationality. Why is that? Because Henrietta Lacks was an uneducated Afro-American woman, which for the American public health system could be considered just uh, a source of self-reproductive cells. While Mary Mellon was a 15 years old, stubborn Irish teenage uh, girl who emigrated to the United States for a better life. Uh, the differences are a few. Henrietta Lacks, Lacks dies died prior to see how her cell become the source of um, numerous uh, experiments conducted starting from her cells, uh, while Mary Mellon all, uh, was alive and isolated for the sake of the public health. Henrietta Lacks may understand, uh, may, uh, she, she actually understood she is ill and cancer will cause her death, but didn't have the time to understand she can ask for a medical professional to give respect to her illness and provide her with best treatment, while uh, Mary Mellon was a healthy carrier in denial with no understanding on how she can spread the disease, she's actually not feeling it on her body. And this was it. Thank you for your attention. Thank and you very I'm waiting much, for Anna Frunza. Questions. Thank you very much, Anna Frunza. I was, um, I was listening to the final part of your lecture and I got lost in my own uh, questions, just imagining the lives of the two women and how they might have been. And uh, thinking that at this point, we're uh, light years away from what was then, or are we light years away? Professor Antonio Sando, because I can see you have opened your microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna Frunza, for this uh, great introduction to ethics um, of uh, public health. In this uh, period of uh, crisis, maybe, hopefully, the end of the crisis, or, well, or near to the end of the crisis, but this is the moment uh, where um, bioethics should interfere in the discussion about what was good and what was bad, because in the times of crisis, maybe there are uh, very few hearing to disposed to understand the, this crisis. Uh, for example, the, does state have the right to isolate you just because uh, you are presumed to, uh, a, pub a public health? Um, issue, a public health uh, dangers, the danger for public health, um, or um, a problem that uh, comes in my mind when I listen to your presentation was, uh, did we have the ownership of, of our own body? Is this my body? But did, did I own it? Is the ownership of my body at least guaranteed by the constitution? Or the property? I am uh, own, I own a house. Let's say the property is protected by the constitution, by the law. Of course, um, uh, they can be executed uh, and they can be taken by the states because we have the to, uh, dates to the state. But at least I have a protection, a, a legal protection. But do I have a legal protection for my own body? If so, my, well, my cells could not be used without my consent in any case, even for the great, great good, but also the property of my house could be taken if states wants to driving a road, um, highway. Of course, in Romania, the state does not uh, build many highways, so it's not a problem, uh, but, any other country in the United States, they do. 
and they can take your home and say, well, but at least they give uh, some money for it. But they could take your cells and do experiment like in the Harriet Lars case and does not receive anything because she was not considered owner of her own body. And it's important. Did we own? Of course, my body will be let down when I die. But, in, but until then, am I the owner of my body? So it's, this is the, the case, the most important part for me, the, for my I'm understanding. Because otherwise, um, Harrieta Larks died anyway. They do not interfere with the treatment. The, the cells was taken from, uh, um, research, from research, but prior, prior they were used to diagnose her. And it was used for diagnostic and the diagnostic was real. I think, I don't know if it was good, the diagnostic or bad, but maybe let's say it was good in their time. So maybe, uh, maybe you will say, and this is uh, uh, the biobanks uh, laws in, the, in our time. Well, there is no uh, intervention in your life. You die anyway. And that, well, we can use your biomaterials for a greater good of humanity without compensation because, uh, well, the body is not, the cells are not anymore in your body. So we take it and we use it as we give our uh, hair to the haircuts and they use for, but they don't. Uh, they kill, couldn't use your hair to make, uh, uh, how they say, um, how do we do, do wig for, from your hair? They need to pay, no? But maybe they don't, if you use your cancer cells for putting in space in the Harriet Alax case. But anyway, well, she was not hurt by taking her cells out. Maybe, maybe she was. Um, but, uh, but did she want, but did she want that her cells go in space? Was uh, her, um, no, she didn't know. So she could not express. Is it important to express the way? Maybe yes, maybe not. But did she want to use her, her um, cells to make weapons? Do I or you or anyone else have the right to say, no, I don't want to use my body or my body part for destruct humanity or to, well, the, the, these days uh, they say, <clears throat> well, uh, you go to vaccination. And European Union uh, make regulation that no vaccination passport should be used and no discrimination uh, in this area. And uh, it's good because it's your right to do what you think of course, it is interfere with uh, with um, public health. Your right interfere with the right of any of other, because you are vaccinated, supposed to uh, be safe from. Um, it could be a, a carrier anyway. So this is another discussion. But you, if you read the this uh, regulation that uh, say that uh, on, that will start uh, uh, from. Uh, First of June, a manifestation with with more than a hundred uh, people or uh, something like this could be done in Romania, but if only if all participants are vaccinated. So uh, the uh, the state restrain my rights for public good. So is the same or not? Am I still in quarantine? Well, in the, in the period of quarantine, do I have the right to take my money from the bank? No, because I go to the bank and say, no, you cannot, you cannot enter. Why? Because you cannot. Um, 
Okay. I could understand that uh, I should uh, uh, sacrifice myself for the greater good, for the benefit of society. That's okay, it's important. I could understand. But now we say, well, you are vaccinated or you're, you're not, uh, you could uh, go anywhere so, and so on, but you, if you're not, it's okay. You assume that you cannot go to the party or something like this. But hey, if I'm vaccinated, I still carry the, the virus. So uh, why I, if I'm vaccinated, I'm free. And if I'm not, I'm not free because I am anyway a threat for public health. Is this uh, right? Is it social justice? No. So that's interfere uh, bioethics. And that's uh, the problem of Harrieta Lux and uh, typhoid Mary. Uh, the problem of typhoid Mary is very similar in a way with uh, COVID nations, COVID world in 2020. It's not just one, it's a whole world in quarantine. And we did, humankind did put all the humanity in quarantine. And uh, I re recently be informed that in, uh, in Ireland, in the Pacific uh, Ocean, in, in a country in the Pacific Ocean, with no case of uh, this virus, no case in, in, this, in that island, was put in quarantine because other islands in the same country have a great uh, rate of, uh, of the disease and infection. But why it's quarantine the island that there are not? See, just put in quarantine, everyone. Is public health? Is just policy impose something in the name of public health? Is the health dictators? Could we prevent, should we prevent this dictatorship? Or could it be extend if we can dictate in the name of the quarantine of the, of, in the problem of the disease? Could they also impose the, this dictatorship if we do not uh, use a uh, um, kind of people, Jewish people, for example, in Nazi Germany, and we put them in quarantine and the, in the camp, in the death camp. This is a, a problem where humanity could go if the democracy are not understanding in this way that the right should be assured in legal and not only in legal protection of human rights. So this is important to understand bioethics, not because, oh, one case of uh, Harriet Alax, well, it's one case, it happened 50 years ago and there's no more the, this possibility in the world. But yes, it is, and it is now. It's, I'm uh, think it's important what you said, what this uh, presentation was important for clarified the position in, of bioethicists, not me or you or Andras, but the position that the bioethicists should explain, not take position, we're not to civic, uh, militants. We just say we scientists, scientists, ethicists, philosophers, social, uh, sociologists, and social workers, and say, well, this could be go to, to could be drive to very very uh, much problems if uh, bioethics and if law are after do not uh, say this is the limit. It should be a limit, of course when the danger is very high, like last year in, May, in March, yes, some measures should be done. How this measure should continue? What limitation could be acceptable? What can you do for people? Let's say uh, Tifoid Mary. Yes, she's a danger for, uh, for society, but at least sh she should uh, have some compensation or not, are the state obliged to do compensation? In Romania, because it was in, in Europe, in European Union, uh, of course, because there were many cases of unemployed, unemployment made by this uh, crisis, the state give uh, compensation, partial compensation of uh, losing uh, um, money in this, uh, in this period to the company and for the person, for the people. 
But what, how about uh, India? They do not have possibility to give compensation. How about, uh, let's say, other country? Katarina, uh, I see you uh, have a question, Sandra. We can continue moderation for three or four minutes. We can uh, uh, have uh, continue this, uh, this workshop. I was expecting to extend uh, the limitations of time for this workshop because, uh, of course, it would raise uh, discussions. So, uh, Catalina, please, I won't take any of your time anymore. Thank you so much. Yes, I was thinking about the uh, patient with can patients with cancer, and uh, I know that if they want to uh, be in a study, they have to give their consent. And I was thinking of their vulnerability and uh, the relation of power between the patient and the doctor, and that they would just accept almost everything, thinking about their lives and about the, the fact that they could live longer. But I, I, I wonder if, um, wouldn't be, uh, let's say, more fair to say that, to, to tell them that it might be um, maybe a chance for other people because it's not, it's not like if the study is going on, they would have time to benefit of it. I, I don't know if, if it makes sense what I'm, what I'm saying. It, mar it makes perfect sense, but you are putting into question the actually informed consent process put into practice. And this, uh, this situation in the case of uh, Henrietta Lex, actually this is the main ethical yeah. issue because there was no informed consent. And uh, if you will go in the literature, you can see there are many aspects that informed consent involves. One of these, um, these aspects is actually the clear understanding of the patient status. And yeah. there are separate um, direction uh, there is clinical care and further involvement in medical research. Mm -hmm. By going from patient care to medical research, the patient uh, should be informed that um, he will be subject of mm -hmm. research that could improve the other uh, patient's, future patient's life, but it never guaranteed, it's never um, an insurance that he will benefit directly from uh, this kind of help. And this is the thing that the patient that accepts to become a research subject should understand and accept. Yeah, I'm asking it because I know many cases where the family and the patients accepted to be parts of, of some studies in cancer, but they had the feeling that uh, it will be for her, for, for the patient. And this is why I, I was thinking about what we were saying about being very clear with the patient, telling him exactly what's going to happen uh, by its participation, by his participation. They actually are going into a misconception about the, the yeah. utility of the study they are getting mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes in the clinical, uh, uh, in clinical trials, in, uh, well, in the stage three or uh, other stage higher and uh, in clinical trial stage three or something, uh, yes, it could benefit from themselves if they are in the, not in the, in a good uh, environment, indeed in the lot, experimental lot, not in, uh, uh, in, in other uh, parts. Uh, so yes, it could benefit sometimes and it should be informed. They also should be informed that maybe is not in the in the in the lot that will have uh, this treatment. Maybe is in is in control group, mm. and it's and it's uh, uh, is not. Uh, he will never know this in what yeah. they part. Maybe uh, will not uh, uh, put in the in the treatment group. So. Yes, you should be informed, but in many cases, you just not will have no benefit because it's not uh, in the stage one or stage three. Or it's just a, a clinical uh, research right. that will that will be developed in mm -hmm. now. Uh, that year was a problem uh, last year because they do vaccine in one year, but a clinical trial needs at least three years. Or vaccination. It was a crisis all over the world, so they do rapidly. 
And maybe the persons that uh, uh, provide the cells for that uh, treatment will benefit for the treatment, for the, for the vaccine, this is possible. But did there's those uh, Chinese that was given cells for uh, study for, uh, in this, uh, for this vaccination, did they was informed or not? In, uh, I think it's important to understand, to, to clearly make him understand, but so, there was an error and we start, uh, and I started to study and I was involved in this study. And many times in the consent for treatment, they say, uh, they are uh, afraid to say, I accept that uh, my image and my uh, cells could be used for research, for further research, but just broad consent for, do it everything with me, that's not good, or with my body part or with my cells. Yes, theoretically, they, we do not harm you. So if I take a cells, I do not harm you. There's no problem. But my consciousness, object, object of consciousness could be done. If you use my cells for, for let's say, uh, uh, genetic uh, research, that will uh, change humanity for a uh, thousand years. Should I have informed at least? Should I have give my consent? Because me is involved or could be. I will say that every cell taken from person will be used in this, uh, in this situation. But could it be? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio Sandu and uh, Katarina Nicolau for, uh, for your uh, debates. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for taking part in this masterclass. Unfortunately, our time has expired long ago, but uh, the discussions were much more, much were very interesting. So uh, we just couldn't stop in time. Thank you very much, Anna Frunza, for giving us the opportunity to uh, listen to such interesting cases that uh, are still actual and still create debates. And uh, please join us in the next event of Lumen World Congress that is going to take part at 11 o'clock, uh, Bucharest time, uh, a philosophical ca cafe on uh, the fourth place of our existing e space, of our existence e space. Thank you very much. And um, join us for the following Congress Day.